Oh, thank you so much, Jane. Oh, well done for getting through all those letters. <laughs> um, yes, I'll give you another few letters now. Welcome to Ida Hobbit. And no, it's not just the sound that you're making when you're trying to interrupt bigots. Uh, my name is Saba Chowdhury, as mentioned. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. Like, hey, did you see Saba today? Yeah, they had such a cool Zoom background. And actually, they made it themselves. I did. <laughs> If those pronouns make you nervous, you can just use my name or make a donation to trans youth organizations like Gender Intelligence instead. Um, I am biased. Um, as mentioned, I do work there proudly as one of the heads of the youth service supporting trans youth and trans youth workers across the UK, uh, London and in Leeds as well. I'm also a writer, poser and public speaker, all of which is what has brought me here today virtually to Exeter Uni. So thank you, Jasper, for inviting me back here to Exeter Uni again, and to Maddie, Ellie, Jane, and everyone else who's put their time and effort into making this an empowering event. Whilst I'd love to see all of your faces, uh, we are putting safety first today. So thanks to everyone in the audience for sticking with those rules and thanks for being here. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak to fellow Muslims who celebrated last week and lockdown Mubarak to everyone else as the restrictions ease up today. <laughs> So speaking of ease, uh, let's make this evening go as easy as possible. Um, I just want to share a few like well-being reminders. So take screen breaks, close your eyes, relax your focus, look at something in the distance or make heart eyes as your house plants nearby. Drop your shoulders, um, take a big slow breath in. And then all the way out again, repeat that as many times as you need. I know my shoulders really tense up after a day at my desk. Uh, stretch your legs, stand up, shake it out. Roar if your housemates don't mind. Um, write notes, make scribbles, fidget, stim, um, and take part if you want and ask questions. All questions are welcome. We've got a few points today where yeah, you can put them in and the rules for the Mentimeter uh, get cool gadget thing is in the chat as well. And as mentioned, we're going to be taking a break later before we have Q&A um, yeah, later. So yes, it is Ida Hobbit. Uh, that's the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. It's a day, but not the only day, where we raise awareness of the discrimination and violence that LGBTQ people face worldwide and then take actions to protect them. It's a day about liberation, essentially. And I thought what we could do as uh, as an icebreaker to use a Mentimeter to hear from you. Uh, got a really simple question, and that is, what does liberation look like? Give a word or two words. Um, it would just be really great to hear from you. If we were all together, I'd definitely get everyone um, answering and hearing from you. But um, this is a really lovely way to hear from you. Um, so just be mindful of all the, uh, the, the, the respectful rules that we have. Um, we can all see what you're writing on the Mentimeter. Um, it is being moderated, but save our tech team uh, a few seconds and don't write anything you wouldn't want the world seeing. Um, one of the rules that I have is um, think about everything you write as on a postcard. And if, um, if you wouldn't want anyone else seeing it, then maybe don't write it. <laughs> so um, I can see we've got it up on the screen now. Thank you, tech team, wherever you are. <laughs> um, no worries at all. We'll just give people a few seconds and minutes to, to put their um, their answers in. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll close the voting down and then we will show everyone's answers. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, I mean, it's nice to talk about um, liberation. I think often people expect expect me to talk about oppression today and i think as a trans masculine gender fluid person of color i generally rather not talk about the discrimination and violence that i face that's reasonable isn't it <laughs> but um for real i think generally we can learn a lot about how to protect and support lgbtq communities locally and globally um you know and i can't today ignore that injustices are happening in palestine and colombia and we can learn a lot about solidarity too by understanding the role that we have in harm, just as opposed to learning about the harm that happens and the oppression. So this is why this question is a really nice place to start. Um, and, you know, it, it is about you and it's personal, it's anonymous. So just, yeah, be as open as you like. I think um, 
yeah, we all have a role to play when it comes to discrimination and liberation. You know, um, LGBT phobia doesn't just happen to LGBT people, um, it happens because of because of people. So um, yeah, uh, how are we getting on? I mean, I could keep talking, but... <laughs> it's okay, I am just sharing now. So hopefully everyone can see our lovely word cloud that's popped up on the screen. Amazing. Thanks, I'm just gonna bring that up for me. Lovely. So we've got openness, relaxed, access to healthcare, very important. Uh, oh, co-produce, getting my good neck stretch in there. Raising one another up, power for the powerless, that's really nice. Acceptance, joy, respect, freedom, being myself, freedom to be yourself. Um, that come, that's come up a few times. Free Palestine, thank you for writing that. Self-care, yes. All of these things are so important in 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 what it, what it means to feel free and liberated. And I love that there's so much from like the personal self-care to like solidarity with others. Uh, power for the powerless, that was really nice. Uh, what else we got? Expression, no judgment, kindness, a process. Yes, it is a process. Um, it doesn't just kind of happen um, or it's not just a tick box exercise. That was gorgeous. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that might stay open for a bit longer if you want to keep adding to it. Um, but it's just really nice to start at because it's it's such it's such a personal word, and yet and we can apply it to so many different things. Um, and I just want you to keep all those things in mind when, um, as I'm talking today, any questions are coming up. Great, hold on to them, and uh, we can also have a conversation about it later. So. Coming back to um, what I was saying about um, understanding our role within uh, liberation and, and oppression, I think I just I don't think it's enough that we are kind of just simply aware that we're aware of these mechanisms and pressures and differences within these communities in the world. Now, don't get me wrong; it is great to have LGBT awareness. It's great to have everyone be aware of trans and non-binary identities and who we are. I mean, I personally love to enter rooms by simply shouting, beware. Um, no, I only did that once or twice. Um, and, you know, awareness will bring about change. There we go, trans awareness. I, made it, I tried to make it fun as possible for you with some cards. Um, so awareness will bring about change. And it does come from a small colored ribbon to a public event like this. But it can often feel quite external as something that happens outside of us, you know, something that is seen. and. I want to be seen. I also want to be heard and held and believed. I want to bring about change and change minds. And I can do this, it can happen, but I think then we need to strive towards acceptance. Acceptance, that's when something much deeper happens within us, something that is held on to. When we are aware of injustice and mechanism, mechanisms of oppression, we don't often do anything. We learn, we inform, we're aware. And when we accept the same injustices and mechanisms of oppressions, then the next step is kind of clear. Do something to change it or do something to protect it. Because that's uncomfortable, right? Accepting injustice, accepting the oppression and the harm in the world. And when we are uncomfortable, that's the place that we can act from to make it better and feel right. And I do like making people uncomfortable. So if that is how you're feeling, then this is going just right. And I know, I know this is purely semantics. We're getting into the meaning, the exact meanings of, of words and it can be kind of dry. And maybe some of you think this is a bit pointless. And that's okay. Take what you want from this, disagree with me, and let's talk. Personally, this distinction is important to me because of my own experiences. When I came out as trans, one of the first responses I get was, are your parents supportive? It's a fair enough question, but to hear it so immediately after I, I came out, it just felt loaded. It carries with it a shadow of stigma and assumption that I've been rejected by my parents, um, that my family don't understand me. And we watch these shadows of stigmas in the media and they follow us in newspapers and they live through questions like this, which are, which feel coded. And 
I can't really answer that question. Not because it's not true, but whether my parents were supportive of me or not, uh, whether my parents were supportive of me or not of me being trans is rudimentary in itself. It's too simple for my experiences and for my relationship with my mom and dad. It's the wrong question if you want to know how my relationship is with my parents. It's the right question if you want me to confirm your assumptions. Because my mom and dad weren't always supportive to start with, but they were very aware of what I was doing when, in terms of uh, changing my gender and what I wanted in terms of my medical interventions too. I remember I would like scroll and dig through Pakistani media channels and YouTube channels looking for anything on Pakistani trans men, which is what I came out as at the time as a trans man. But the only thing I could find was a news article on a trans man called Shamiyal Raj. And I showed it to my dad in, in hopes to raise awareness that Pakistani trans men exist. Why was he in the news? I hear someone ask. Well, he was imprisoned charged with lying to his wife that he was trans. They were both imprisoned. Um, I'm not sure why, but a cab. So then me and my dad were both aware of how Pakistani trans men are seen by the world. Yeah, that, that awareness didn't help me or my dad. It just didn't mean that much to me. It wasn't until they started to accept it, my mum and dad, that yeah, this, this is happening. I'm transing. It's scary, it's new, it's out of their control and beyond their hopes for their daughter. But they accepted all of that and they accepted me. And that meant a lot, it still does. You know, I don't take for granted their own journey of acceptance. And yeah, I guess they support me, but still not all the time. They, they support me the same amount as their child whom they wish to be safe and comfortable and married, but that one is a universal South Asian experience, I think. Personally, the acceptance has made the most impact on my life. Support is secondary and awareness a byproduct. I remember another time I spoke at an Ida Hobbit event um, in Bradford, actually, about stereotypes and how LGBTQ people can overcome racism and Islamophobia. As soon as I leave the stage, a white woman grabbed me and demanded I take part in an interview with her for a local radio show. She's waving this blue microphone in my face and pulls me to a quiet area of the room. I don't know who she is or even what radio she's from. The red light on the mic goes on and she starts recording and asks me to introduce myself. I don't know what she wants me to say. I don't know what this interview is for, but she's so excited and I realize she's excited to speak to me, a queer trans Muslim person. And then I realized exactly what the interview is for. And it was the shortest, probably the best interview I have still ever done. She asked me, have you experienced prejudice? She chooses her words carefully there. I say, yes, of, of course I have. And what about in the community. Hmm, which community is that? Oh, any community, all of them. Yes, all of them, prejudice is everywhere. She starts to wrap up, clearly I'm not saying what she wanted or expected to hear. And what advice would you give to a young person who wants to come out? You don't have to, thank you. <laughs> yeah. An interview like that would be great to raise awareness of people like me, but there's nothing that's really working towards acceptance of people like me, nor anything that would actually help me personally. So yeah, I strive for acceptance. That's the second step. The next one, trans liberation. Although I think it takes more than just a step to get to that one. Actually, it's more of um, an embarrassing little dad dance towards it. It's awkward and it's not quite right, but fun, but embarrassing, but fun. The dad dance or mom bop or parent shuffle is those awkward fun steps around gender liberation before we get to trans liberation. And that is how we'll get there. How we empower trans people is by empowering people of all genders 
breaking down stereotypes of women and understanding gender diverse experiences will all help us understand men, cis people, all genders. We have to understand that the pressures that we face because of our gender or our bodies comes from the same systems, sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, they're all linked. And I'll tell you a secret, it's not just trans people who have genders, everybody does. So this really is everyone's problem. I remember um, after an event I spoke at, I asked everyone to introduce themselves uh, to the person next to them with their name and their pronoun, which is what I probably would have done today if we were all together in the room. So after my talk, a sweet middle-aged man comes up to me, really excited saying, I never knew I had a pronoun until just now. You see, it's never too late, bless him. Everyone has a gender, everyone has a pronoun, a gender expression to you. And everyone is under the same gendered expressions, expectations and stereotypes. We just internalize or conform to different ones depending on our personal experiences, upbringing and bodies. So when we argue against trans people, we argue against the things that make up all of us. When we say that women are actually like this and if you wanted to be a man, you'd be more like that. Like, who do we think we're comparing trans people to? It makes it harder for cis people too because they're saying for women to only be this and men to only be that. Cis people restrict their own genders as they try and come for us. When I started passing, which is a word that I don't personally like because it also upholds the idea that looking like um, a cis man is, is the goal and that trans people are somehow less than if we don't pass. But I know it's important to some to, to do that. But what I really mean is when I started being perceived as a man by the world, I started to realize how narrow this man box is, like how little freedom men have to express themselves, their masculinity. The comments I would get for being a carer for my dad, wearing a, a bright shirt, for not fighting back when harassed by men or drinking cherry flavored beer. Like the alternative was plain beer, like, come on, I'm, I'm not drinking that. Dudes, like, this is what we're defending. This is what manhood is. Like, no wonder we are so fragile. It's not much choice we have. And again, it's not a trans thing. To think about what makes a man or what femininity is, is, is not a trans exclusive journey. Gender is not a trans thing. And to explore your gender is not a trans thing either. And the gender liberation movement will be led by gender minorities because that's what people on the margins do. You know, we assemble, we organize, we collectivize. We climb to get perspective of who else is at the edges and who's at the center. Where can we build bridges? Where can we tear down walls? Where can we burn borders? So give your gender a chance is what I think I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, genders don't know who is trans and who is cis. So maybe we should follow suit with that. Yeah, I know it's a social construct. Gender isn't real, et cetera, et cetera. But it affects my life. Gender still dictates how people talk to me, how they listen to me, how they hurt me. The world says it's real and I do have to agree sometimes. But I'm a big fan of sitting on the fence. It's not always comfortable to sit there, but I know I'm saying gender for everyone and gender for no one. Let's all interrogate our gender identities and let's all ignore gender forever. But if there's anything that being non-binary has taught me is that I can be both. So one, give your gender a chance. Think about your gender. Be aware of your own gender. You know, everyone has one. And I do believe that we can understand each other, others better by understanding ourselves first. And once we're aware of our gender, we can understand how gender operates in the world. We can start to pick up on those differences as gender moves through different cultures and different classes, for example. Two, understand the steps and reasons why we need trans awareness, trans acceptance, and the gender liberation dad dance towards uh, trans liberation. Three, talk to someone else. Keep these conversations going. Ask me, Maddie, and each other questions. Tell your housemates or your WhatsApp family group chat. 
What are you thinking about gender today? Sitting on the fence? Invite someone else up there. Just start a conversation. Thank you for listening. And thank you so much for all the questions in the chat. Haven't had a chance to have a scroll through just yet, but um, I know we're going to be taking a little comfort break now and have some more chances to get those questions in. Um, I know we've also got another question to answer just for fun um, in the chat as well. Uh, aims at the trans people and non-binary people in the audience today. I would just love to hear what gives you joy. And that'll be another word cloud like you've just done with the question to start with. Um, That's great. Thank you, Seba, so much for that. Yeah, we've got the link in the chat now, everyone, for them, the next question, um, just while you're having a little comfort break. Um, and then when we come back, we will go through what you've submitted and then on to the Q&A. Thank hey. you. Oh, yes. Time, what time do you want people to come back? Um, I believe we've got a 10, 10 minute break. So come back in 10 minutes time. So for, uh, where are we at? Well, I can't see the time. Sorry, it's it's half past. So at 4.40. Thank you. Okay. Questions come through. Um, so where do we start? So we'll start with a question that I know you have an answer to, Sarah. Give you a <laughs> soft pitch to start off with. Yeah. Uh, how can we make sure our spaces, both trans spaces and LGBT spaces more broadly, are meaningfully inclusive to trans people of colour and not just offering lip service? Thanks, Maddie. Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Um, I've actually um, been doing a lot of talking and thinking and writing about um, the issues of inclusivity. And I've got a couple of um, resources that you can access, which, which um, I really created to answer all, all the questions around how to support trans people of colour. Um, one of them is a free uh, PDF download you can find um, on my website. Um, you can go to sabachowdhury.com forward slash link or forward slash inclusivity and that will take you to um, right there. And really it's like those practical things what you can do um, in your organisation or like community group or workplace or um, wherever really, um, and what you kind of need, need to know around, yeah, thinking about inclusivity on, on lots of different levels. Um, the other thing, uh, thank you Jasper, is um, I've also been really fortunate to um, be publishing a book around this issue. Um, it will be out in January next year, but um, you can pre-order it if you're really keen. But um, definitely check out the uh, the inclusivity guide and and make sure you you follow me across socials. I'll be doing some events and other bits of writing about it too. Um, but really, the person who I want to quote on this question and and kind of flip it back to you is Rennie Edo Lodge, who wrote uh, "Why I'm No Talking to Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race." Um, she's a journalist and writer. And with this question, she gets quite a lot as well, you know, what what can I do? Um, and and she says, well, the question really is, what can, what can you do? Um, she says, you know, I don't know where you hold power or influence in your life, what kind of access to resources and um, people or, or anything like that you have. Um, so it really is a question for us to ask ourselves, like, okay, what can I do? What can I suburb do in my position? Um, you know, within a youth service, you know, I, you know, with this kind of platform, um, you know, with this kind of position or with this um, income or, you know, socio socioeconomic status, um, you know, where I'm heard, where I'm seen and where other people aren't. So what can I do, you know? So, yeah, kind of a, a, a question, and I'm answering your question with another question, but um, I really encourage you to explore that for yourself. Mm. I think it's a really important question for everyone to think about. Um, just to throw in my two cents, because I love this question, with organizing events that are inclusive for trans people of color, I think it's really important that people don't go into it with a preconception of what people of color look like. So I've been to events that I identify as like the whitest person of color on the planet. My mom is African-American and she's from Puerto Rico and I am this color. And I've been to so many events that are aimed at people of color where they go, oh my God, there's a white person here because they expect you know, they expect brown people or they expect black people and i think it's just really key to 
kind of highlight people in the same way that no true trans people are going to look the same or have the same experience. It's not going to be the same for all of us people of colour as well. But I think it is really important that everyone sort of take a step back and go, what can I do with my power in my situations to make sure that our spaces are a lot more inclusive? Nice. Um, just a note for everyone, the links that Jasper's put in the chat, both to Saba's website and where you can pre-order Saba's book, um, they'll also be circulated in email afterwards, so don't worry too much if you miss them at this point, because I know there's going to be more questions appearing. Mm. Um, next question, let's do, how do you personally, and trans masculine people especially, how can they do better by, how can they do better in supporting our trans feminine sisters and siblings? Mm, that's a really good question and I'm, I'm glad uh, someone asked about it. Um, I, one, of, one of the most important things to me about my gender journey was, was um, I guess, discovering feminism. So I'm a feminist and understanding like gender from a feminist perspective that enabled me to understand what, what, it, what it means to be a man, what masculinity is. Um, and having those conversations with other trans men and trans masculine people was just so important to me and um, how I feel about my masculinity. And that's, that's been constant for like the last however many years I've been, I've been, um, been, tran been trans, I've been out as trans. Um, and another thing that was really important in my, in my journey, which I always come back to is a book called Whipping Girl by Julia Serrano, who's a trans woman, um, an American author. And that, that, that really changed so much for me. It really made me understand tra misogyny, trans misogyny, sexism, and my position in that. Sorry, it's, it is like a thunderstorm out here. It's kind of distracting for me. I don't know if you can hear it because it's absolutely outrageous. Um, but I'm talking louder because I'm trying to talk over the noise. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I would really recommend reading that book. It's, I mean, it is um, it's like quite, quite a few years old, so a lot of the, the vocabulary has changed. But Julia Serrano has written some more stuff. Like, there are just some trans women out there just writing and speaking about, about their experiences and about feminism and about empowerment that I think we all should be listening to. Monroe Bergdorf, for example, as well. Um, and just talk about it, like, with with other trans masculine people and trans men like these are conversations that trans women and trans feminine people don't need to hear about they know because they they are, exist in this world so interrogate your masculinity like the questions i ask myself is like what what is my masculinity like what what does it mean and what like what is it defined by because i think so often what it means to be a man is defined by the by the people it oppresses and like by putting other people down, with women down mostly, and what can we define our masculinities against instead? What, how can we have a masculinity that feels tender and empowering as well as, you know, strong and holding as well? So yeah, I could talk about masculinity for a while, but I won't. Um, but um, there is something I, I I spoke at an event called We Create Space Around Masculinity, which I think is available on a podcast. I can try and send it afterwards as well, um, but I really recommend, yeah, having a listen. Brilliant. Uh, we've got so many good questions. It's really hard to figure out which which order to do them in. Um, how can solidarity and allyship move beyond just saying nice words? Are there specific conditions that we can support our trans community in tackling, or specific issues that we can help empower them through? Hmm. It's do you know this makes me think of it. Makes me think of the that word cloud of gender. Uh, um, sorry the word cloud where we ask you what liberation is and it's so many things other than just saying those nice things and I wonder if there's maybe we can we can share that with everyone afterwards so just like have a look at and be like mm, yeah there there are so many ways that we can um make people like make liberation happen um and one of the words that stuck out to me was um a process or something I think somebody said something about it being a practice um so definitely yeah think think about it in that way as well um yes hearing nice things is is great um but we can do so many more other things as well and i guess maybe ask if you know maybe, maybe what what maybe ask ourselves the intention behind these actions like why am i saying this you know saying something nice to somebody else is it to make them feel better or is it to make me feel better and then 
maybe that will also direct what uh where our liberation comes from as well yeah yeah i think that's really important i think an easy way that you know allies can be supportive of the, of the trans community we see all the stuff that's going on in the press at the moment about uh getting gender recognition certificates and about access to hormones and things like that and i think the more cis allies we have on side in trying to convince the government to change these things it makes it harder for them to say oh this is just trans people saying that they want this you know and it makes it a lot harder frustratingly having cis people on side makes it a lot harder for the government to kind of just pigeonhole it as oh it's a trans issue that no one else cares about so we can kind of forget it i think there are a few kind of big key things but also realizing that for some people, hormones isn't a big deal. I, I don't plan on having any kind of medical transition. I'm just going to stay the way I am. And um, so I think it's really important to kind of center those trans voices and listen to what the actual community think they could do with support on. Mm. Um, Ellie's just confirmed as well that we'll share the word clouds with all of the attendees. So the liberation one and trans people, what brings you joy, everyone will get a copy of that afterwards as well. Nice. Um, just on the back of that question, and this might answer a few others as well around, um, I think someone might have mentioned tokenism or, yeah, you know, the kind of doing how to make spaces empowering. And it reminded me of this um, tool, I guess, called the Ladder of Citizen Participation, which is by this someone called Shelley Arnstein. Um, it, I, I just came across it the other day um, when, as I was um, studying hard at uni. Um, and it's basically this ladder with different rungs of participation um, from uh, non-participation, which is like no power, to tokenism, which is kind of a like a, like a false sense of power, to um, actual power, which is like kind of what they, what they call citizen participation. Um, have a look at it, because I think it just really help me to understand like there are so many different ways that we can enable people to participate and thus feel empowered um uh yeah I, I think i can share a link as well afterwards um do check it out i think it's also been developed into a tool called the ladder of empowerment as well um yeah again take what you want from it yeah Sarah coming through with all the resources today Sorry? Sounds like Saba's coming through with all the resources <laughs> today. It sounds like that would be a really good thing. I'm I'm really interested to take a look at that. Sure, thank you. Yeah, um, there, there are so many good resources out there. I'm like, you don't want to always hear from just me. <laughs> uh, I think this one has come from someone within the community. So often it feels like uh, external support is severely lacking so that we end up relying on one another for support. So. How do you cope with juggling uplifting someone else without risking sinking yourself down too much? Mm. Oh my God. When you have an answer to that, like, let me know as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think my number one thing, and I, I suck at it, I'm going to say that straight up front, is trying to focus on self-care as well. Like there is only so much you can do before your tank is empty. And if your tank is empty, you have nothing to give to anybody. So I think making time, even if it feels really selfish, and you go, oh, there's so many terrible things going on. There are, but you have to have that capacity to be able to support it. So you have to like eke out time to take care of yourself first, although I'm really bad at doing that. And I think most, most people in the community are really bad at doing that. Yeah, uh, it is really hard, but you know, you nailed it. Like we need to care for ourselves and last year when we just you know the the pandemic hit us um and you know everything changed you know i i just lost my dad as well and i was just like i i'm struggling and my best friend said to me and i felt really bad because i was like i you know i just can't i'm not doing anything i'm not doing enough i'm not out there i'm not with you know with my community i'm you know I, i'm just i'm really having a hard time but i feel really bad and my friend was like Saba, the revolution needs you to be well look after yourself because you're going to be needed later. And that has really, really stuck with me. You know, it's not selfish that we care for ourselves because we're a part of the, we're a part of the trans community. If we care for us as a trans individual, like we're caring about the trans community. So put yourself first, you know, self selfish doesn't mean, you know, isn't a bad thing. Um, you know, we can be self-centered and we can be self-aware and it can still be yeah, beneficial to others. Yeah, really important. Thanks, Maddy. Uh, where should we go to next? 
someone said, the revolution needs you to be well. I love this commitment to both ourselves and our causes. And I think you're right. Right. We can't we can't help our communities if we're running on empty ourselves. So it's kind of trying to strike up that balance. Um, someone said, why do you insist that everyone has a gender? What about gender neutral people or people who find gender dimorphism oppressive and do not recognize it in themselves? You're absolutely right. And I should have said this earlier, you know, everyone has a gender, whether that is even, you know, no gender as well. Um, it's you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because it's kind of talked about as part of like the gender spectrum in that it's like above or like outside of the door of the gender spectrum. Um, so yeah, I, I do apologize for um, not making that clear. But um, yeah, it, I, I agree. Um, oh, a very interesting questions just come in. I welcomed your description on plurality and gender, and you mentioned about passing or not. Is social pressure on all LGBTQ people to conform to binary stereotypes increasing? I'm just having another read of that. Uh, is social pressure on all LGBTQ people to... <laughs> that is a really tricky question. I think that's so hard. Um... I, I don't think I can answer that. I think there's there is always going to be a pressure on people to conform because, well, actually, maybe this is why it's tricky because conforming to a certain way of, of looking or presenting your gender isn't always about, yeah, passing or cho like choice, I think, because I'm thinking about safety and visibility um, and how I know sometimes I, you know, make a, a special effort to pass as a, as a as a cisgender man or to look straight whatever whatever the hell that means um or even to, to look not muslim because all those kinds of visual um cues and markers make me a target so often it is about other things that come first like yeah like being safe and i know that also impacts black people and trans women and trans feminine people more visibly gender non-conforming people um differently as well so yeah, it's it's a it's a tricky question. I think it's yeah, I can't answer it just as it is. Um, any thoughts, Maddie? Um, I was thinking about this. It is a really difficult question. I know that certainly I've seen, and I do not pay attention to social media or pop culture. I still live in like the eighties, which is before I was born, but it's definitely where I am now. Um, and I think there are so many more. Well, not so many more, but there are more celebrities and sort of public personalities that are coming out as non-binary or gender non-conforming and so I think potentially there is slightly less pressure to conform to binary stereotypes it's because people have been forced to become more aware of the fact that there are more than two gender identities look at people like Sam Smith who came out as non-binary and uses they then their pronouns and people are going oh my god I didn't realize that you know I assumed that they were going to come out as trans I didn't realize that there was you know, people see it as something in between, but that there are other gender identity options than male and female. So I think if we see more of that happening, then might, hopefully that would mean there's less pressure for non-binary people to feel like they have to conform to one or the other. But we will have to see. It is a tricky question. Uh, let's see what else. I know I've missed some brilliant ones. Let's scroll back up a bit. So someone said, isn't acceptance always conditional, i.e. shouldn't we move beyond identities and assimilative rhetoric? What is trans liberation if Muslims or people of colour, for example, continue to be oppressed? Yeah, that is exactly like, what is it if, if, if this um, other oppressions continue? You know, I, I really believe that um, all liberations are connected and um, I'm just going to scroll up to read the question again because I'm very like need to read things. Um, I've got a pen in my hand, always writing. Um, where is it? Oh, here we go. Isn't acceptance always conditional? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I, w I would love to do like, I wish I could hear from you actually. I think you probably have some really good points in this because I agree. Like when we get down to it, there is always going to be, yeah, those racialized or gendered or ableist or classist lenses on that acceptance um it's 
Yeah, it's always there. And I often get myself into a real like spin when I do go into it, because then I find myself like just without any kind of answers. Um, it's yeah, it's hard. Uh, yeah, should just I'm just rereading it again. Should we move beyond identities and assimilative rhetoric? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is really tough and moving beyond identities. I mean, for me, yeah, in an ideal world, we're not going to have to label ourselves. You know, I'm not going to have to go, yeah, I'm a non-binary trans person. I identify as Hispanic. I should just be able to go, I'm a person. And that's all the information that people need. But our society doesn't work like that at the moment. And it is really difficult with all of these liberations. It can feel like they're competing against each other. And for people who do kind of fall across those intersectional boundaries, it can be really difficult to try and figure out what's the best use of your time. But I think by focusing on the community that you're a part of and making sure you're lifting up voices from other communities that you can't speak for, like I can't speak for brown people, I can't speak for Muslims, but by trying to make sure that those voices of that community are heard, I think that's the best way we can kind of move towards complete equality. And it's going to take time and some things are going to move faster than others, but we've got to do the best we can. Nothing's perfect in this world, is it? <laughs> For sure. Oh, and, and that's it, isn't it? Our, 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 I think it is about making people understand that it is just about liberation. And I guess, you know, I've kind of already said this, this is why I like to start there. You know, it's, it's going to benefit everyone that we all have the freedom to express ourselves, you know, um, gender liberation will benefit trans people women um all everyone um you know um you know breaking down racism and anti-blackness is going to benefit everyone of all races and ethnicities um i think it starts with understanding that yeah mm. um so one of the comments on the word cloud for what does liberation mean? Someone said nothing about us without us. So someone said, how can we juggle nothing about us without us with the problem of burnout? When there are so few of us out, the strain falls on the same few people over and over again, but we don't want to be cut out of these dialogues. So I, we've kind of touched on this already. So it's kind of about juggling, you know, how do we juggle making sure that our voices are heard without completely burning ourselves out? Mm, yeah, I was just thinking back to um, my own experiences of, uh, of 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 being the the only trans person or the only person of color or the only Muslim or the only this in the in the room or in the organization or in the community, um, and the strain definitely fell on me to then advocate for those people. This might not be what you were talking about, but it's, it's just what I'm. Um, what I'm thinking about so do clarify if uh, if that's wrong but um and yeah of course I don't want to be cut out of that dialogue because if I'm not in the room then who who is who is speaking for people of color or um or trans people there if I'm not there and that isn't that shouldn't be on on me you know that should that responsibility should not be on me and I think that's where our allies and um accomplices and 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 friends and and people who care about us come in you know to to make sure that's happening. Uh, yeah, I've just been through those cycles of burnout too. I don't know about you, Maddie. Yeah, I remember it feels quite similar to something you were saying. When I went to my undergraduate university, I think it was the first out trans person that they'd had to deal with. And so obviously the first topic that came up as it seems to be so often is bathrooms. And their response was, well, you can always use the disabled one, which for me as a disabled person was totally fine. But it was very difficult being the only trans person there to constantly have to be like, no, that's not going to work. And I think you're so right. It was about finding allies. And sometimes you might not have the capacity to be in all of the meetings, but finding allies that you can trust to have a conversation with you beforehand and kind of tell them this is the kind of thing, we, the kind of view we want to get across. You need to make sure that people are listening to that. Mm. And just making sure that they're as, as well informed as possible because we can't be in every meeting, you know, especially in some, some organisations, it can feel like there are so few of us that are out and you could spend your whole life 
just advocating for trans issues never mind the fact that you've got a full-time job to be doing as well mm. so I think you're right it's about finding those allies and I love I love the idea of finding accomplices I'm going to start mm. finding accomplices for all of my trans issues yeah oh and and you know just on that and, and thinking about burnout and, our, and looking after ourselves there might have to be a time where you do cut yourself out of that dialogue because it's just not helping you but it doesn't mean that there's no dialogue happening like you can have a dialogue with yeah with with your friends with other trans people or people of color or um who, you know whoever your community is and have a dialogue that's 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 also going to benefit you so yeah don't be afraid to say no either and so we've got a few minutes left so one or maybe two more questions um so we've just had one come in how as an institution and an employer how can we give our trans students and staff the space to work on trans liber liberation and make sure they can get involved in these issues with their own experiences? Hmm. I, I actually wondered if you wanted to answer that one first, because I guess you might be best place for that. Um, I could try. I've actually been writing an a article about this for uh, a journal that's probably not going to get published because I'm a terrible author, unlike Saba, who's you know written a book. Oh, God. Um, it's about it's about making the two key things I think are making space for it so making the culture feel like working on inclusivity issues is an acceptable use of some of your work time it can feel like we have to do it all in our free time and that obviously leads to burnout so much faster and I think the other thing that I find really important that actually I feel like the inst our institution's doing really well now is making it clear that senior leaders, the people that are running whatever organisation actually have an interest in this and it does go further than just the lip service of oh we want our company or our organisation to be trans inclusive and having so with like the sexual orientation equality group and our gender equality group we've got members of VCEG who chair it so we can see that we've got this clear senior leadership that are invested in supporting the trans community and uh, I know we've got a, a disability one as well so all of these kind of intersectional groups having that senior leadership going yes this is important and we're going to really push for it it does take some of that pressure off like those of us at the coal face we're not fighting an uphill battle all the time we've got that support kind of pulling us up oh that was great i mean if and if your um article is anything like what you just said then like yeah i i, <laughs> I hope you can share it with us afterwards um I think that sounds so important and I love what you said about um like valuing people's time and in, in 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 paying them I mean I know you know financial re repayment isn't everything but it definitely helps especially when a lot of people of color trans people um etc are on on the margins and already um in kind of less privileged positions so I think it's one way to really make trans students feel valued um and I was thinking back to the to the what gives you what gives you joy word cloud and I wonder you know just seeing all the ways that like that trans people feel joy and um feel happy and how to how to kind of build a space that reflects that or just encourage those aspects of uh trans students lives to happen as well um but I mean asking the question is also a really good place to start and asking it to a zoom room full of um you know I see mostly trans people as well coming to events like this, um, you know, sharing them because we've had like, you know, I think there was like 70 people sign up. So it's um, it really means a lot as well that employees and institution, um, uh, you know, kind of senior management are are here as well listening. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. thanks. Right. Let me see if I can find one more quick question. Uh, it's so good to hear you talk about trans liberation moving beyond just awareness. Do you have any advice for moving friends and colleagues beyond just acceptance towards respect? Oh, I'm going to go back to one of my favourite things to do, and, and that is to make them uncomfortable. Um, I think when it comes to moving past that, it becomes about the person. Like, there's there must be something there that is like a block to them moving forward a little bit more. I imagine, um, but I think, yeah, there, there's probably just a bit of bit of work that needs to happen or a conversation with themselves. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I, you know, even I, I have to do my own work, you know, there's so much um, internalized racism and Islamophobia and, and homophobia 
sexism that I am working through. And that's always going to be that block be between me and feeling like I can accept or move past or, you know, share my platform or, you know, redistribute power or something like that. Um, that's the kind of next step that comes up for me. And those things don't have to happen with you around, you know, don't feel like you have to be the one to like listen to them through their kind of, in, you know, working through their internalized transphobia or something like they, they need to be doing that by themselves with a mental health professional, like, a, you know, with, with a therapist or with um, their other cisgender friends as well. I think that last point is so key. It can feel like when people say they're trying to be accepting and they're constantly at this issue still, or they're raising issues, especially around things like using people's pronouns, it can feel like as the trans person in the group, you have to kind of go, oh, there, there, you know, it'll be fine. And you have to support them through that. But actually the onus is on them to do the work. And I think it can be really important to remind yourself, I know I'm really bad for it. Say, actually, it's not my responsibility to make sure they work through their issues. Obviously, we can give them information and kind of help them out a bit, but they are the ones that have to do the work mm -hmm. and we can kind of push them in the right direction. And I think making people uncomfortable is a really great way of kickstarting that work and making them realise, oh, actually, these are issues that they might not even be aware that they have. Like you say, internalised homophobia or something I dealt with for such a long time when I first came out. Yeah. And it wasn't something that I was necessarily even aware of until someone said to me, oh, actually, that's, you know, that's, good. that's a really big issue. And so I think just making them aware that they do have these sticking points and then they have to do the work at that point. Yeah. It's really and, key. Yeah. And, you know, I know I say kind of be, be, be uncomfortable kind of flippantly, but it, I know I'm talking about within some kind of reason, but I think there is something there around like around our shame that and, and guilt that needs to be looked at. Um, and that's why I say, you know, in the right place, you know, with the right person who's going to really support you through that. Cause that shame will, you know, it runs deep and that's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm being flippant, but also I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive too. Yeah. Brilliant. I think that's about all the time we've got. So I will hand back to you. I don't know whether it's going to be Jane probably, but thank you so much for answering all of those questions. So fantastically, Sava. Thank you for joining in, Maddie. It was really great to do this with you. You two have just done an amazing job by answering so many questions. There literally are tens and tens of questions, but also having a really, really great conversation that was uh, fascinating to, to listen to as well. So thank you, the people who wrote the questions, but thank you most of you two for, for doing that so, so well and, and so engagingly. Um, really, really enjoyable. And I'm sure... Uh, we'll look at all of the questions as well. And if there's anything that we can pick up in themes and things like that, then we can feed it into the gender equality group or the sexual orientation group um, because there's things in there about, about the university and about things in more general. So um, really appreciate that. We won't, let, we won't let the questions go to waste now. People have made the effort of, of, of popping them in there. So, you know, you said about keeping the conversation going, Saba. I think that's our job, isn't it, from now on? But I am aware of what we were saying about um, juggling burnout and all of the emphasis on people in the community to, to be that translator sometimes um, into organisations. So I've, I'm going to really take that away um, into the gender equality group and think about how, how we don't always... Um, maybe focus on the same people, but, but spread that a little bit wider and get you more accomplices. I think that's my job, isn't it? Is, uh, and I do love that word too. So thank you so much for engaging. And thanks to, the, to everybody who's been part of the discussion this afternoon. It has brought joy. It really, really has. And the Mentimeter has been a good, a good tool as well to sort of bring out some of those words and descriptions for people. So yeah, really do appreciate it. And again, last thank you and shout out to Jasper and Ellie and Maddie and you two, Saba, and all everybody for um, organising. And just to look forward to any more in the Graduate Speaker Series as well. Fantastic, really, really interesting. Thanks you all. And um, it's time you can go out and have a drink indoors or go and have a meal indoors so don't waste the opportunity and speak to you soon bye bye